It's Friday, it's three o'clock. Welcome to Together Unlocked on this very hot day. Mm. Um, I'm Jim Gosling, I'm an artist and artistic director of Together 2012 who are bringing you this live stream today and indeed every Monday, Wednesday and Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. as part of our Join In From Home programme. With me in my East London studio is... I'm Julie Newman. Uh, I'm a refugee from the stage play of Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> and for anyone who doesn't get that because we haven't done the audio description yet, Friday is uh, dressing up to go out to stay in day. So after some introductions from the West Midlands, we'll talk about our outfits next. Okay, so good afternoon. I'm Robin Sergina, also known as Angry Fish. I'm a um, business director at Together 2012 and one of the excellent co-hosts, I should say another of the excellent co-hosts for Together Unlocked and we're up here in West Midlands. I'm Josh Sergina. I'm a PhD research student uh, most of the time uh, and I am the best assist of the Together hosts. <laughs> um, and I have uh, kind of swept over messy blonde hair uh, and start us off on uh, what we're dressed up to go out or not go out in. And um, I am wearing a lovely bright orange uh, t-shirt with a uh, embroidered blue polo player on it, which is one of my more summery t-shirts that I like to wear on holiday uh, or when it is actually warm in this country for the week that we get summer. Uh, and I'm wearing it to very considerately not go to Bournemouth Beach this weekend. Robin, what are you dressed up to go out Okay, to? over to me already. Well, I wasn't sure we were introducing why we were talking about it. Shall I do that? So just to remind people that um, on a Friday, we, we have a little feature to make it a bit of fun called Dressing Up to Stay Home. Um, this has come from a tradition that seems to have started in New Zealand where they dress up very, very posh um and and um formally as if they were going to be going to the opera and stay in so we are choosing to create outfits out of our diminishing supply of unused clothes to uh to to, to deliver some humor or otherwise about where we are going to go so i'll describe myself um i have silvery blonde white hair all of those today uh i've got no rimmed silver armed glasses bit of a shadow on the chin um and i am wearing a black polo neck t-shirt and it's quite complicated on the front is a union jack but the union jack is kind of broken into pieces and words and in english italian french and german i believe reading it backwards and upside down um, it says Smash Fascism, and it is a T-shirt from a band called The Senseless Things, um, who, in relation to the whole Pride stuff, um, had a very famous, certainly in indie circles, song called Homophobic Deep Hole. Um, be because of the members, there was, I can't remember exactly now that, that which member of the band or more of the band um, identified um, as with from the LGB community uh, and they were touring America and came across some very homophobic attitudes and then sang about those attitudes in the States, which is quite an interesting and brave thing to do at that time. So, you know, all power to them. So I'm going to go and revisit some senseless things material whilst wearing this T-shirt later. Oh, that sounds like fun. I should say that some of us do actually enjoy dressing up. It's not just for your humour. <laughs> <laughs> but that's perhaps me being a bit more girly than people expect me to be. I'm Jude Gosling. I've got very short tenor red hair, very short because I took my assistant's dog's clippers to it last week. You probably can tell that even on a camera. It's Pride weekend, so I am dressed up to go to virtual world pride i'm also the co-chair of regard now that's what we describe as the lgbtqi plus disabled people's organization meaning 
an organisation led by disabled people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, or any other of that group of identities, any way that you might choose to describe it, because people from different cultures identify in different ways anyway. We've been having a Zoom each week to celebrate Pride Month, and our final Zoom is tomorrow at three o'clock. You can get the link by emailing secretary at regard.org.uk. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that up on our highlights and links page. If you're watching this show on YouTube, you can also find it on our website under, unsurprisingly, Together Unlocked TV. And immediately beneath that page in the pull down menu, you will find highlights and links. So the videos that we show today, any artwork, poems, and in particular links, that's my flag, Judy, because <laughs> it goes off to pride without a rainbow flag. So I am waving a rainbow flag. My regard t-shirt designed by myself, as it happened, because we couldn't afford a designer, is a plain white t-shirt. It has an upside down lilac purple triangle. And on that triangle is the wheelchair symbol with a rainbow on it. And regard is in lettering on white, just cut out one side of the triangle. And I have my rainbow <laughs> flag, which is not appropriate for where you're going, Judy. So let's hear from Judy Newman how you're looking, what you're wearing and where you're going. Uh, I have... Um... I don't know where to start, actually. <laughs> sort of like, I've, I've shut myself up. Um, <laughs> sort of like, uh, today, uh, on my uh, silver and gold hair, I'm wearing a, a very strange hat, um, which has got a peak. It's got a, a base of a sort of beigey brown velvet, and it's got all sorts of multicolored patchwork sewn into it. Uh, it's a bit like what I would call an Oliver hat. Uh, it's like... Uh... Could I join in there as I've <laughs> lent it to you? This is a lovely mustard yellow velvet Baker Boy cap, heavily Boy, embroidered, yeah. genuinely from Glastonbury, circa the 1996 hat stall, currently with perished elastic, so rather loose and I suspect hellishly it hot. It does, does sort of <laughs> Yes, you see, Daddy, Judy is now <laughs> pulling the brim down and you can see it's not patchwork, it's a beautiful set of yellow, red and green embroidery. It Absolutely would, vintage is the expression. With my vintage outfit on today, it might well be slipping down during the course of the programme. I'm wearing dark rim glasses, uh, a big smile, slightly scared because I've just been rude about vintage outfits belonging to somebody else. <laughs> this this T-shirt's about 1991 as well, by the way, or two, something like that. The little ravers together, aren't you? Uh, I, I'm wearing today. I'm wearing a, a T-shirt which Jew says is uh, trippy geometric patterns. I like to think of it as a bit astrological, but um, I'll go with what Jew says. So. This weekend is festival weekend for me. Um, it starts, well, it actually started last night with the BBC coverage of Glastonbury. Uh, so I'm going to virtual Glastonbury, Glasto, I think they call it. Um, I've never been ever in my life. So this is, I'm, I, I would imagine I'd be called a, a Glasto virgin. Um, so, and then on top of that, uh, there's 26 hours of virtual pride. So I'm going to have a weekend of, festivals and music and loveliness and around 3 40 we'll have our usual regular event something for the weekend and we'll be looking at the links and exactly what's on for pride and glastonbury then i was watching the julian temple glastonbury film last night i don't know if anybody else has seen it i'm not even sure when it was made i think it was early to mid noughties but I was looking at some of the performances and thinking, I was on the side of the stage for that. I was on the side of the stage for that. And just thinking, God, I was so lucky. And then I thought, however, my days at Glastonbury are permanently over. But I was saddened to read today that Mike Levis was saying that Glastonbury would go bankrupt if they can't put it on next year. And 
from the inside, even in the 90s, you know, I think every production I've ever worked on, Glastonbury is just the most professional. And they've got a huge, huge outdoor space. I sort of feel if anybody could achieve distancing and, you know, it's easy enough, as we all know, to keep the numbers in. Ah, we seem to have just lost Robin and Josh, but we will hope to get them back. In the meantime, I'm just going to slightly rearrange the screen and keep talking. Julie. Yes, yes, yes. Could you tell us next about Olive Morris? We will move on to say what week is this? What month is this? What things are we celebrating today? And we always start with your useful information. Uh, well, it's the 26th of June, so it's the last weekend in June. Um, what I noticed today was the they've got something called a Google Doodle. Um, and the Google Doodle was... Uh, a cartoon of Olive Morris outside of the uh, the squat in Railton Road, one to one, Railton Road, and it reminded me of um, Olive Morris, obviously, uh, who was uh, a, a wonderful um, activist. She was one of the first black feminist anarchist activists in, um, in certainly in London, if not in the country. Uh, she came over from Kingston uh, as part of the Windrush generation when she was nine with her parents. And she was schooled locally in Lambeth because I, I used to work for Lambeth Council. So, you know, her name was quite familiar to me. And it was really interesting to do a little bit of background reading. She apparently was radicalised when she was in the um, the Brixton um, Desmond's records, I think, uh, in Atlantic Road. And the police came and stopped uh, a Nigerian diplomat from going into the record shop uh, because he was driving a Mercedes car and he had his wife and his family in it and they could not believe that a black man at that time in 60 when would have been 69 I think 60s around the late 60s anyway for sure actually could drive a Mercedes car which of course is ridiculous but it's it, it she got involved and she was brutalized by the police she was badly beaten up because of how she looked she was badly beaten up because she was black she was badly beaten up because she was trying to support and help this Nigerian diplomat. And they, within the Wikipedia account, that's what radicalized her. But she then went on and did some, some brilliant uh, collecting uh, black women together in Brixton. She, she started, she was very much uh, in favor of squatting empty buildings, which if you think back to the 70s and 80s that was absolutely what was necessary at a time when housing was so desperately needed um, she also was part of the black power movement and she she helped to sort of create a, a, um, an attitude of questioning um, amongst young black people and indeed young white people in Brixton um, and she died very sadly um, quite early on, I think it was 1972. She, she, she was only 27, I think. Um, and she died of, of cancer in St. Thomas's Hospital and she died much, much too soon. I think the general thinking is that she would have been a force to be reckoned with politically. Um, and it's such a shame that she was never able to achieve that. In 1986, I think, after the Brixton riots in 85, Lambeth Council, um, decided to name a building in her honour, and that was Olive Morris House, which was the housing benefits in the finance office. Now, Lambeth Council is about to tear that down and put up social housing and all sorts of bits and pieces. It's been empty for five years, but there's a group who basically call themselves um, Remembering Olive, Remembering Olive Collective, I think they call themselves, and they've reformed um, and they're seeking donations, but they're, they're basically, they're trying to make sure that when the new building goes up, it has a, a you know, commemorative plaque attached to it. 
but they've done in the past. They've done an amazing amount of work. And there's a Olive Morris uh, archive at um, Lambeth Archive. And, you know, if you start to do a, a search in your search engines, there's an awful lot of information to be had. And there's some brilliant images some photographs of her and when she was being active. And she was such a wonderful, powerful woman. Hi, welcome back to Robin and Josh from the West Midlands. Thanks for that, Julie. As the guys dipped out, and I'm afraid we're told with the heat and it's Friday, the internet is likely to be a little bit tricky today. Could you just remind them of the beginning of that and who Olive Morris was? She was a, a, a radical black activist in the um, sort of 60s and 70s, uh, sort of early 70s. She and today is... is uh, the anniversary of her birthday when she was born. She was part of the Windrush generation. I think we did get most of it because you didn't go apart from a few glitches. So I don't know why we yeah, did. Well, otherwise, there's always the recording. We put the show's up about well it really varies because again it's the speed of the internet it can take us anything from an hour to three and a half hours to be able to download the recording enhance the audio sort the captions out and upload it again but generally by eight or nine o'clock you will have the video with the captions either ready at the same time or processed very very slightly afterwards and thank you again to Julia from Global Real Time Captioning who started producing our live captions this month. If you're watching on YouTube and you need captions, if you go to our website www.together2012.org.uk, we have live captions streaming beneath the stream and then we process and combine those two together for the evening recordings. The recordings stay online and we started this show on the 30th of March. So there's actually quite a backlog to watch. We shouldn't really go on any further without just picking up the lockdown changes again we were discussing on Monday and Wednesday and what's been happening with the beaches. And I will go first because having spent about five years working near pool off and on with a caravan on a nature reserve, I was just horrified to see the state of Bournemouth. And yes, I think it's just worth reiterating that actually shielding doesn't come to an end in as much as it comes to an end at all until the 4th of July. If you're on the exceptionally vulnerable list like Julie, it doesn't end till the 1st of August. And that does not mean it's safe. As an artistic director and chief executive, I have to do ongoing risk assessments and I downloaded the government risk assessment and it said proceed on the basis there will always be a risk. And I thought, not sure how the insurers will take that. If I did a risk assessment that said, well, of course, the building might burn to the ground. I'm not sure I would get insurance. But I think it is just about listening to what is actually being said as opposed to these media headlines that suggest we don't have a problem. We still have something like 150 people dying every day that is far more than most countries have lost in total and you know I think it's really important that each and every one of us takes that responsibility not just for continuing to ensure that the virus goes down but that there's nobody needing unnecessary treatment the NHS think it's going to take five years to catch up and those workers are exhausted they really don't need people coming in with sunstroke or falling over or getting drunk and getting into a fight they've really got far more important things to do so our message is still very much stay home stay creative and stay well what else has anybody else got to contribute to that but i think i think the guys have something more to say don't they someone say something if it's printable anyway <laughs> yeah it's just I don't understand. I, I, you know, I appreciate that people want to go out and we've been inside. Um, but, you know, it, it's not about you. It's, you know, it's about your gran or, you know, someone like that, you know, that you might be healthy and 30 and your kid wants to go out. Um, 
But, you know, if you then take them to go and see their grandparents and their grandparents then get coronavirus and die, uh, you know, that, that without sounding too harsh, that's going to be on you for being selfish and going to the beach with half a million people when there's absolutely no need. Um, and I think it's important to add that young people like yourself, we're all on the shielding list. All of us could die if we get coronavirus. I'm going to pick it up with you in a minute, Robin. But I think the other thing that always concerns me is there's a little bit of misunderstanding about the current death figures in the UK. Most of the people who've so far been exposed to infection were either already ill in hospital or in care homes. We haven't actually seen what happens if the population as a whole is exposed. We actually have no idea once you get, because most countries, again, haven't had infections in those numbers. And the American system, you can't really draw any conclusions from because there is no state health care. So lots of people are being ill at home and nothing's being picked up. But if you had infection raging amongst the under 30s, you would see far more under 30s becoming really sick. But of course, the other thing is, you know, we all depend on each other in the sense of, as we saw at the beginning, you know, for goods to flow, for things to come into shops, for things to be open, for the trains to run. If everybody had a nasty cold at once, just for a week, there would be absolute chaos. And that's why we had lockdown. You know, it was never a question of, well, we're locking down because we think people in their 20s are highly vulnerable, but some will be and won't know it. You know, I mean, those of us who know we've got conditions are actually very, very lucky. We don't know enough about the virus. We don't know enough about people's individual genetic profiles to predict how anybody else would react. You know, in, indeed, you know, we might be one of those people who, after all, had very mild symptoms, but none of us is going to risk it, not least because we don't want to give it to anybody else. And, you know, I have a niece who's been working as a cardiac radiologist throughout this and the thought of people giving her more things to do down in Portsmouth that don't need to happen when there's so many people waiting to have, you know, scheduled heart treatment, you know, just doesn't bear thinking about. So again, stay home, stay well, stay well, stay creative. And that is the key. Robin, one final word from you and we will move on to some creative talk. Um, I, I actually think it's all been said. I mean, I, I would just reiterate that if you don't need to go somewhere, then don't go there. As simple as that. You know, lots of people are going back to work. Lots of people are having to go back for work. You know, there is a need to get the economy moving in some way or another. We can't kind of walk away from that fact. But we don't all have to still suddenly go to Asda at the same time or go and get in a 5,000 person long queue for ice cream um, on, on a beach in Bournemouth. It's just ridiculous. And if you got, if I got, if I if individually, if I had thought, you know, I'm going to go to Bournemouth and no one else will go. And I got there. And by the time I'd got halfway down the A30 into, you know, past Christchurch and there was cars already parked on the side of the road, I'd have gone somewhere else or gone home again. Well, absolutely. And I think it's that level of, it's not even self-interest because it's not in their interest if everybody else gets sick. No. People just haven't thought it through. There's lots of time to come. There's lots of things to do at home. I have to say my idea of hell would be to be on a beach that there was that packed. But I think the issue about going to work is we shouldn't forget the advice is still if you don't have to work from an office or a building site, you shouldn't go. The advice is still very much if you can work at home, you should work at home. Because the only way the people who have to go to work can be safe is if the rest of us stay in. And every unnecessary piece of exercise even is making it harder for those key workers to be socially distanced. I, I think just to, I just want to do a, a last thing really, which, um, which has disturbed me no end. And that is that the last two deliveries we've had for our food haven't come in bags. And you think, you know, sort of like somebody's dumping our shopping onto the ramp immediately in front of the front door, which is less than two meters away from the from the walkway from the from the pavement. And we have to open the door up 
to bring it in. When when I've requested bags because we're shielding, aside from anything else, it's much easier to, to manage, obviously. Um, they're, they're, it's not the policy. For some reason, Sainsbury's has gone along with Tesco's and they're no longer delivering in, in plastic bags. You know, and you think, what well, what? There, there's a real recklessness around um, that they can't recognise mm. the need for, for being safe and sensible. I think there's, yes. I mean, unfortunately, Morrison's, who we would usually use, are not running that kind of, you know, they stopped their delivery service, which was wonderful. I'd moved there from Tesco because bagless shopping just doesn't work for us as disabled people. And yesterday I had to watch through the CCTV as this Sainsbury's man with no gloves and no mask picked every single item individually out of the crate and put it into a bag. So every single thing I then had to get out to quarantine had literally just been touched by somebody who had previously, without mask and gloves, touched the food of every single person that he'd just come across. And those would have come from different pickers. So the number of people who'd actually touched that, if he was bringing along the equivalent of 25, 30 people himself, was just terrifying. And I have been really bullied twice this week by the post office and... Um, and I think Amazon to open the door. And I said, but I'm still shielding. Well, what can I do comes through the door. And I said, well, you can just leave it by the bin like the notice says. You know, thank you very much indeed. But it, it really troubles me that there's an official shielding list, including people like Julie, to the beginning of August. And yet before any shielding has been lifted, all of a sudden, all of the delivery people can't see why you shouldn't open the door. I mean, the post have literally refused to do my delivery because I won't sign for it. And the thought of opening the door without warning when it takes me as a disabled person quite a long time to be able to be relatively safe and then even in gloves to touch their electronic machine, it, it just seems so pointless, absolutely pointless. You know, so, yes, I mean, I, I didn't mean to have more than one rant because I'm sure everybody <laughs> watching this is having exactly the same problems. And it's good to document these problems. You know, we do think this is important to have a show that documents our lives as people shielding over time. But, yes, I mean, I suspect there's going to be quite a harsh reset coming up in a couple of weeks. I think they are going to have to rethink about the beaches again. I think they're going to have to toughen up the messaging. And under those circumstances, sheltering till everything seems a bit safer would be common sense, whatever the law says. But now let's move on to that how do we stay home and stay well by being creative and flag up our Join In From Home programme. All of that can be found under the Join In From Home link on our website, www.together2012.org.uk. We have a wide range of activities linked to our clubs programme. Our clubs programme is something we run on weekday mornings. They're free, they're open to any disabled person who can get there and anyone they want to bring with them. And we enjoy a range of art forms. So on a Friday morning, we have art club with drawing and painting. And we describe that as finding your own voice. What we do is we make a whole selection of different types of paint and different types of paper and other surfaces available and different pencils and things. And we encourage people to get on with it. We had just introduced a still life option so that if people wanted to improve their drawing, but didn't want to do something that they imagined they had that option as well and that was going really well particularly fruit people were really enjoying doing still lives of fruit and then eating them so if you fancy drawing and painting but in this heat you can't begin to imagine what you would do I recommend a still life in which case we would also love to see them on this show and I'm Really pleased to hear from Margaret Spence, who's on our community advisory board, that she has been taking up painting for the first time. And I know we've had these discussions around lockdown and not everybody feels like being creative, but I think an awful lot of people have taken one skill and either developed it or learned it from scratch. So she's been doing some watercolours of Ireland, which is where her mother comes from, and she's visited a lot. And I'm going to see if we can get at least one of those pictures up. Oh, 
Okay, so we've got two of them up, and if I press something else, we might be able to see them both properly. Everything is a little bit slow today. They're great, aren't they? Yeah, they're absolutely lovely. They're just taken from pictures that have been taken on a phone. But they're really beautiful watercolours. I really like the way Margaret's gone up to the edge of the pad. The one we're showing two at the bottom of the page. On the left-hand side, you've got a country scene. I think it, I'm seeing a church in the background. It's beautiful greens and browns and pinks and whites. And the other one is a sea scene where you're approaching from the beach. You can see different... Sorry, I'm a phasic for anybody who doesn't know me well. But you can see different bits of the cove coming down. And I think, is that a lighthouse in the distance? Yeah, it looks like it. Somebody help me out here and do a bit more description, Julie. Yeah, no, I mean, oh, I'm going to go with it. I mean, we can see them very well from here. I mean, the right-hand one, um, it is really lovely. because So the, the beach scene, uh, yeah, it kind of the, the picture is... Is, is 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 relatively symmetrical in, in in the sense of the um dunes or kind of rocky crops that are on either side um and, and the way it's done is it it draws your eye to the middle and then out to sea so actually the lighthouse and whatever else is built on the kind of headland really become periphery because it's well i look at it and it takes my imagination to thinking about going through that gap and what's on that other side I think that's great when a picture immediately sparks your imagination of how how it makes you feel. That's for me is a great piece of art. And I think the church, in, because of the distance, again, you're kind of drawn to it and wonders what's going on. Now, there's one more. So I'm going to take one down probably, and put another one up. So now on the right, in fact, I'm going to ask one of you two to start by audio describing this because you're obviously better at it. <laughs> oh, it looks like it's going to be me then. Um, so, uh, yeah, just, just so as you know, you're very, very glitchy at your end and you're just, yeah, we were kind of trying to time it between <laughs> when it looks like you're speaking and not. So, if it, Yeah, so we have the same issue with you, but hopefully on the live stream or at least yeah, the recording, yeah, yeah. they could have so, sorted themselves out. Apologies to any viewers if we do actually cut across each other. So um, the new picture up um, is it's, it's, it's a, a river, a stream, a river, I'd say more river, um, because it's, it's, it's broad enough to, there's a, a very green tree the rest of it looks quite arid so you've got the river but either side of it is a very sort of brown browned out um landscape but with this kind of lovely rich blue vein running through the middle um and out 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 of the picture again and it, it kind of gives an a, a sense of journeying to it for me but then what you've got is this this one tree right next to the water which be I guess represents the, the life from the water because the green the tree is the only green object and then that's reflected back in the water too. Yes, and I like the way it makes a sort of double headed tree. I can't believe if you're watching Margaret that these are your first paintings, but we strongly suggest you continue and please keep sending them in. So I'm just gonna take those down again now. and press another magic button. <laughs> How are you getting on with your learning to draw, Josh? Um, I haven't actually done any more in the last couple of weeks. Um, so I've just been kind of really busy with, with uni. I, I had tried uh, drawing a uh, hole from, from the same uh, show and um, because I kind of I like the the art style, um, uh, a kind of a, a full body uh, drawing of, of the character. Um, originally I was kind of following the step by steps, um, 
it was one of those kind of weird ones where there's lots of lines that you then delete afterwards and things like that. And it was, um, I, I was finding it was getting a bit kind of messy. So in the end, I went to the finalized outline picture um, and then just kind of started copying that just by eye um, and just drawing kind of the final lines as the first ones without the guide, um, which, which was going okay. Um, I'm horrendous at hands, kind of hands and fingers. Um, I always just look you know, nah. difficult, I think. Um, so uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't finished that one because uh, I've been been a little bit busy, and uh, and yeah, I need to learn how to draw fingers because otherwise it's a, a kind of good leg, body, and head, and then some kind of very funny looking hands. So uh, need, needs a little bit of refinement, I think, before I uh, debut it to the rest of the world. But it's coming, I think. And I think I'm right in saying that you've learned a lot of this from YouTube videos and information on the internet. Where have you found that? Um, yeah, a couple of them have been uh, kind of still images of, you know, step one, two, 35, um, or, or however many there were. Right. Um, and then some of them have just been um, YouTube ones. But in terms of finding them, um, I've just been putting kind of how to draw x into um google and other available search engines um i think that's a really google because um, yeah, just, to draw. yeah and just kind of flicking through the top results you know there's hundreds of thousands of results but kind of flicking through find the one i like or the one i think i can follow and just kind of cracking on with it um well, it sounds like it's going really well, because once you start skipping stages, it obviously means you've already progressed. Yeah. And as we said at some point in the last couple of weeks, when we had a drawing expert come into the art club, his recommendation was don't say you can't draw till you've drawn every day for at least a year. You might be very surprised indeed. And I think it's true to say we'll be staying at home a lot for at least the year to come. So I expect you to be a very good drawer indeed, if there's such a word, which there probably isn't. <laughs> We've well, had in the past some lovely coloured drawings in from Pratesh Patel at Act Up Newham. And Pratesh has worked with Act Up this week to create what I can only describe as a multimedia animated extravaganza we will try and give you a little bit of audio description at the end but now i am going to play to you a film called imagine by act up newham and just to remind the others to put your microphones on mute when i got my eye Hi, Martin. I'm in a cheap station. Go and see stand for my photography Greek. I'm walking, then I'm sitting down on the train. I'm waiting till it stops so I can get off. I'm in a restaurant. It's warm, relaxing and lots of food. I have ordered spaghetti, papadum, and pina colada. It is a friendly atmosphere. Oh. I'm my own party. Oh my friends are mainly I bowling. I with my friends. I bowling, bowling in wood feet. I get a strip. I win. I run, I run, I run. I in the Olympic park. 
Sunbathing at the beautiful sun. The kids are playing. The sea is so peaceful. ever fabulous piece of work um it's so inventive and 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 finished off with the track that i wish i had written um <laughs> not not purely because i'm sure he's earned a gazillion pounds from it but it just works it it, it, it fits its brief doesn't it yeah, <laughs> i just like to pull off that hat <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm just continue to be so impressed by Act Up Newham, who are our officially our associate drama company. Every single week since lockdown started, they have made a complete production. And that one, again, with Pritesh from the credits, I understand that Pritesh had done all of the drawings, which was an incredible amount of work. Julie, a little bit of audio description, and then we will move on to something for the weekend. Uh, well, you caught me on the hop a little bit there, Ju, but uh, <clears throat> the way that it was, was set up as an animation was that there were pictures of the individuals who were each saying their stories against a, a, back, a drawn background, and they had introduced uh, ambient sound and uh, you know various sort of songs, etc., as befitting the individual scenes. I think as an animation, it's a really good technique, and it works very, very well indeed. I never fail to be amazed at how quickly those guys collectively gain in their skills and competences. And I think we do need to put a, a shout out for Hannah as well, who's. Uh, you know, one of their, their creative technicians. Well, absolutely. So, again, big respect to Act Up Newham. Keep them coming. We love them. So that video will be embedded on our highlights and links page, and so will everything else we're about to talk about. Dr so following on from dressing up to go out to stay in, what will you do when you stay in, you ask yourself, and we say something for the weekend. So we've already discussed in Glastonbury and Pride a little bit, but Julie's just going to tell us where to find them online. We're going to put the, the links up um, after the show onto the website. Uh, but there's a, a World Pride, well, actually it's Global Pride uh, website, and from six o'clock tomorrow morning, it's uh, streaming live shows from all over the world. It starts off in uh, Australia, well, actually starts off in New Zealand, um, moves over to Australia, then comes up to Hong Kong uh, and uh, starts to move across uh, towards India. Um, I was quite interested when I looked at the program to see whether they would be doing anything from Russia. Uh, and they are. So I'll be interested to see how that goes. There's also on the program uh, a couple of um, <clears throat> protest marches. So uh, they're protesting against, uh, well, they're protesting for 
LGBTQI plus rights. Uh, I think one is from a Baltic state, and I think there might even be something from South America. As we go over Europe, um, the Pride London isn't really um, featured that greatly, although we do have um, a little bit of... Uh, what's his name, Ju? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <coughs> Give me a clue, Judy. Oh, he runs his own organisation. <laughs> You know, Peter Tatchell. Peter Tatchell, that's the one. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that was so, impressive, Drew. That was. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like 20 questions, but without the clues. But with um, one question. <laughs> exactly. Who is this guy? <laughs> you know. Anyway, Peter Tatchell, I think, is is one of the one of the few representatives of the UK. Um, but it, I'm really looking forward to the Canadian um, contributions and also the Mexican. Uh, but it's it's 26 hours. It's a streamathon, if there's such a word, and it finishes, I think, eight o'clock on Sunday morning. As I said previously, in and out of that, the BBC have got a massive Glastonbury program, uh, which again I'm really looking forward to. And I think it's going to be for me, as I said, a festival weekend, similar to last weekend, which was very very. Um, astrological uh you know sort of like um astronomical actually not astrological beg your pardon um so there's that speaking well, we saw of, that coming yeah, <laughs> right <laughs> speaking of astronomicals there's a, a call out via the guardian from nasa to design a lunar loo with a toilet for the um 2023 moon landing so it's a, it's a toilet which has got very distinct specifications. They want something that's designed that uh, people can not just pee and poo in, but they can vomit in and <laughs> generally be sick in. So we'll so, check that out. Yes, I was going to say, that seems very linked to Glastonbury, though not necessarily Absolutely. something to do for the weekend. But one of the things that strikes me is it's such a great opportunity this year to enjoy things online that have never been seen before and possibly will never be seen again. One can, in fact, go to a beach any old day, but the idea that there's so much free work around that you can just plug into and access all from the comfort of your own home under a sunshade with a cold drink seems to me to be rather wonderful shall we go over to the west midlands yes. and see what you recommend to do this weekend um yeah so obviously glastonbury is going or not glastonbury glastonbury is going on at the moment and um, and there are performances um I, well from yesterday through to monday um which are kind of you know the highlight performances from glastonbury over the last however many years you know there's uh stormzy from last year i think david bowie is one of them foo fighters oasis blah you know all of the you know if you went online and said what are the top 25 Glastonbury performances they'll be on at some point this yeah. weekend so is there anything live um, at all I don't know okay. um, but they're all available on uh, BBC iPlayer which you can access on everything really phone laptop tablet TV um, outside of Glastonbury um, the the few things that I wanted to mention um, one, do you actually remind me, I think, when we we're talking about um when you said practice drawing every day for a year. Um there's an artist called Mike Winkleman and he goes by Beeple, which is B-W-E-P-L-E, -E, um, who starts and finishes and publishes a piece uh every day. I think he spent I think he gives himself about 45 minutes as a time limit every day to create and, and render this piece. Um and he's done that every day for the last 13 years. Um, he's very self-deprecating uh, if you kind of read any of this stuff. Um, but yeah, there's 4,805, I think, as of the, the most recent one, uh, images that he's done every day. Uh, so you can spend all weekend looking through all of those and probably still not finish. Um, and then there was one final one, but I don't know if you've got anything you wanted to jump in with. Well, you go with yours. I have, but... Uh, Emily and I, who's my sister, have just started re-watching uh, 
Avatar The Last Airbender because uh, it's just come out on Netflix or oh, she just started rewatching it. Um, and whilst it is a children's cartoon, um, it's don't just dismiss it's very political and it's all about kind of uh, fighting fascism and inequality and propaganda. There's, it's a very kind of deeply political show for a children's show. Um, and don't watch the live action film. It's horrendous. Um, but yeah, the, the cartoon is, is really good. And I think it, the times at the moment that we're in, um, it's kind of quite sobering to, to watch. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've not even heard of that, but I do have, fortunately for us, Netflix. I say fortunately because it's not always easy to be locked down. I mean, we literally haven't been out of the door since the 10th of March, have we? So um, it's nice to have the distractions is all I'm concerned. I mean, I like, I I have to say Avatar is quite a good show. It is one of those ones that crosses over and has a good story. Um, and it, it's really inclusive of disability, LGBT rights, and um, you know, for a children's show that came out 15 years ago, um, and then the the follow on that I think came out six years ago, and um, it yeah, it, it covers lots of things okay. and not in a superficial way. And then for me, um, as as ever, I've decided to try to go as as non mainstream as possible, but failed a bit. Um, I've sent three links through, so they'll go up on the website. Um, the first one I thought was very interesting is just that we talked about uh, Manchester Coalition of Disabled People and their 35th anniversary. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked, and particularly about Ian Stanton, who um, not only kind of was the author of most of the Coalition's early publications, but was a fantastic singer-songwriter. Um, and, and in looking up Ian, um, I found a uh, a link to an episode of Link, which used to be a Channel Four uh, kind of disability magazine, um, which is just a, a, a kind of you know face to face with Ian talking about kind of where he came from and the songs he writes and lots of snippets of songs, and it's actually really good. So you don't have to do it at the weekend, but it, I just think it's something you know quite different but if you're linking about a bit of music something that kind of yeah just nice um the second thing is uh as we know julie in particular likes her nature stuff and i've put up a link to um shropshire so something out of london obviously important um shropshire wildlife now have an on have have a, a website but they are now hosting kind of weekly online nature walks and chats and stuff like that. Oh, um, I'm not sure if the first one isn't till this Wednesday, um, but apparently once they've gone, they are still also available online for an amount of time. So something quite different, really. Um, and then very quickly, as ever, I've, I've kind of scoured for something that gives you loads and loads of options. Um, and this week it is glamourmagazine.co.uk. Um, which is a very seemly, family-friendly glamour magazine. Um, and it is all about like just, just a whole host of things that you can do at home from, you know, and how to cook banana bread the best way with a famous chef, um, how to have the best lockdown relaxation bath. Just loads of kind of things that you think, okay, Things that actually, we, you know, very, very simple to do at home. I mean, subject to ingredients or the like bubble bath. But I mean, just, just a really good host of things that actually that aren't about sitting down and watching something online, but about getting something from line and going away and doing it. Yes, I mean, I think we shouldn't forget that for all of the physical isolation, people have been connecting in other ways, in ways that they've never done before and it's not just opened up opportunities for people like me who need support to leave a house who need a PA who need to do a bunch of parking and you know it all needs all becomes a a bit too much I went to the survivors poetry zoom last night as discussed on Wednesday there was somebody there from Spain there was somebody there from New York and there was somebody there from San Francisco even if I could park at the poetry cafe in central London I would not be meeting those people (laughs) 
So I think as time goes on, you know, the risk is very high, but the hazard is much lower. So we can relax a bit and just really enjoy some of the opportunities to meet people and do things with people and do things that we would never have done before. You know, we do believe that everything will be back to normal at some point, not too far in the distant future, but unlikely to be this year. In the meantime, there is an awful lot to do. If you stay home and stay creative, you will stay well to enjoy everything else later on. And on that very positive note, I'm going to wish you a very good weekend from London. Given that we have more than one device between us, I suspect we will be going to Glastonbury and Pride at the same time. <laughs> and we will hand over to the West Midlands to say goodbye. And because it's Friday for Robin, also known as Angry Fish, to play us out with a song. Yes. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, guys. And then whilst Robin gets his guitar, I forgot, uh, Emily Evis did a Desert Island Discs last year. It's really interesting. I'll send you the link. <laughs> Who's my Lindsay's daughter? Who founded Glastonbury? Just for absolute clarity on who we're talking about. Okay, so uh, this is um, actually very Ian Stanton in the sense that it's a proper disability rights song, um, and uh, I had to dig this one out of the annals this morning, but hopefully it'll be great. It is called a song of. The Song of Two Halves. Just get close enough to the mic, okay. You can put us into halfway houses We can chain ourselves to buses you can provide daycare centers we can make ourselves a nuisance you can benefit from testing our integrity we can unite for our peace of mind you can question our capacity if i can hold yours you can hold mine you can protest at our protestations we can learn some sign language You can claim it's in the name of charity We will use our sign language in solidarity If you don't like what you're hearing Then learn to understand what's being said Cause we don't need to bleed your system We just want to move ahead We can be happy We can be sad Take out our frustrations and We can be bad Give me opportunity to Break my chains Give me independence and I'm born again living my life is all i want to do to make love under the stars to visit clap for more crew it doesn't have to be a life less ordinary just a life where I have the choice The choice to be me We can be happy We can be sad Take out our frustrations and We can be bad Give me opportunity to Break my chains Give me independence And I'm born again Living my life is All I wanna do To make love 
under the stars to visit Clapham or crew. It doesn't have to be a life less ordinary, just a life where I have the choice, the choice to be me. to be me. Thank you. Good afternoon and bye from Together Unlocked.